I'm going to start talking about benign prostatic hypertrophy, the first things first, and we need to know a little about the anatomy of what is the prostate gland, where is it present, and what are the anatomical uh, relations that it has, and what are the applied points of anatomy. So when we look at the prostate, it is a walnut-sized gland, which is part of the male reproductive system. It is situated anterior to the rectum and is part of the bladder outflow. Now, what is the function of this prostate? The prostate is responsible for secreting an alkaline fluid that is contributing about 70% of the seminal fluid that comes into the body. And you find that it is also responsible for all of the reproductive functions that part of the reproductive functions that a male possesses. Now, when we look at the anatomy of the prostate, you find that we have an anterior lobe, we have a posterior lobe, there's a median lobe and two lateral lobes. But when we're looking at the zones, we find that there is what we call as the zones which are the periurethral, you have the peripheral zone, and we have the transition zone, and you find that these are responsible for either the prostatic hyperplasia or when we have prostatic malignancies. So when you look at this picture, you realize that unlike other organs, when there is an expansion, you find that the capsule of the prostate does not allow it to expand laterally. Instead, it expands medially, and as a result of which, you can see in this picture that the urethra is the part that ends up getting compressed. Now, you find that when I'm talking about the prostate, you find that it is a structure that develops at about the 12th week of intrauterine life. And you find that, as I mentioned before, the inner adenomatous or the transitional area is what is associated with prostatic hypertrophy. And the outer non-adenomatous, or what we refer to as the peripheral zone, is the area where malignancy or carcinoma is often seen. Now, I'd request you to take a minute to take a look at this picture, and you will see that around the opening of the urethra is where the prostate is present, and you have the urogenital diaphragm, you have the prostatic venous plexus, and then in this picture here, you are able to see the ejaculatory duct opening into that portion, what we refer to as the prostatic urethra, all right? These are points of uh, applied anatomy, and you can see the ejaculatory duct opening over there, and then you can see the prostatic venous plexus, and these are responsible for the torrential bleeding that can happen, or the retrograde ejaculation that will happen after a patient undergoes transurethral resection of the prostate. So the applied anatomy point is that it is surrounding the bladder neck, and this results in what we call as outflow obstruction, and as a result of which, there is a proximal buildup of pressure, and I will allude to this in my subsequent slides. But this is a good slide to remember for the points uh, of applied anatomy. Now, when we look at the structural anatomy, it is made up of fibroadenomatous glands. Now, when I say fibroadenomatous, it has an implication that when there is an enlargement, not only is there a glandular enlargement, there is also stromal hypertrophy. So both epithelial as well as stromal elements contribute to this process of the benign prostatic hyperplasia or hypertrophy as we colloquially uh, refer to it. Now, between the anatomic capsule and the pelvic peritoneum, as I showed you in the previous slide, is the prostatic venous plexus. And this is what is responsible for the hematuria that happens in patients with an enlargement and for the torrential bleed that happens during dissection. So when I'm looking at what is responsible for this enlargement of the gland, we need to look a little at the epidemiology. Now you find at the age of 60, about 50% of the males have prostatic hypertrophy. When we're looking at them at 85 years of age, about 90% of them have prostatic hypertrophy. 
Now, there was this concept that all of this was responsible because of the circulating levels of what we refer to as the dihydrotestosterone. Now, when we look at the dihydrotestosterone, which is nothing but a byproduct of testosterone itself, you realize that as a person grows older, there's going to be a decrease in the level of testosterone. So this prompted a look at what other factors would be responsible and factors like hyperinsulinemia, metabolic syndrome. You find that the role of insulin like growth factors, norepinephrine, you find that angiotensin II are all factors which are implicated in the process of causing proliferation of all elements, fibrous elements, muscular elements, as well as glandular elements. Now this 5-HT, 5-dihydrotestosterone, uh, uh, which is the linked as the crucial factor, bears remembering because this will again have implications when we're talking about medical management of looking at the DHT. Now this DHT is converted from testosterone by the action of 5-alpha reductase, all right? So again, I reiterate for the benefit of students, testosterone gets converted to dihydrotestosterone by the action of 5-alpha reductase and increased levels of DHT is the largest contributor for the development of prostatic hypertrophy. So you find that a large number of alpha-1 receptors are also situated in these smooth muscle fibers in and around the bladder neck, as well as in the prostate. A stimulation of these alpha-1 receptors results in increased muscle tone. And this is what aggravates or worsens the symptoms that we have in patients who have prostatic hypertrophy. So microscopically, when we're looking at the process, it is actually a hyperplasia. Even though we say benign prostatic hypertrophy, it is actually a hyperplasia because there is a proliferation and you find that as a result of which there is a restriction of the flow of urine from the bladder and as a result of which there are all of the clinical manifestations that we have. All right. So the takeaway of a point from this slide is the role of testosterone, uh, dihydrotestosterone and the role of 5-alpha reductase.